Hello aviators, my name is Magna Nordal. I am a captain and instructor on ATR aircraft. In this video, we will have a look at the upgrades to some of the aircraft systems. The ATR-42 and 72 have been in production for nearly 40 years, and it has been upgraded many times. The biggest change came in 2012, when the 1980s style cockpit was replaced with a glass cockpit. And last year, ATS started delivering aircraft with the new air conditioning and pressurization systems. It is called a new air management system, NAMS. At the same time, ATR introduced an updated version of the Pratt & Whitney 127 engine, the XT, with reduced maintenance costs and fuel consumption. In January this year, my employer received two brand new ATR 72600s, with those upgrades. So let's have a closer look. The heart of the new air management system is a computer called the Integrated Air System Controller, IASC. The IASC has two channels, A and B. They control the bleed air system, the air conditioning system, and the cabin pressurization system. For the pilot, the operation of the bleed air system has not changed. But when it comes to the air conditioning system, there is a big upgrade. A year ago, I made a video called Top 10 Mistakes Made by New ATR 42 and 72 First Officers. I numbered them from 1 to 10. One viewer wrote the following comment. Mistake number zero, sign a contract to be on ATRs, hot in summer, cold in winter. Well, that time is over. When you look at the landing gear fairings, you will notice that the gills, where the cooling air is exhausted, is replaced with a circular outlet. And there is a label warning about hot air, because when the aircraft is on the ground in hotel mode, the airflow is very strong and hot. When you look at this figure, we have the rammer intake for the cooling air here, and the outlet is here. Hot bleeder from the engine compressor enters the air condition pack via the pack valve. The air is cooled in the heat exchanger. Then it flows through a compressor in the air cycle machine, which heats up the air. The air is cooled again then it passes a reheater where it is cooled before water is extracted from the air. The water is sent to a nozzle in the ram air intake. Then the water is expelled overboard. After the condenser, the air is flowing through the reheater before it enters the turbine in the air cycle machine. This cools the air to near freezing temperature. The turbine also drives a fan which pulls air from the rammer intake, past the heat exchangers, before the air is expelled through the rammer outlet. This fan is very strong, and it makes this air conditioning system much more effective than the previous system. And this is a great benefit when cooling a warm cabin. I fly in a tropical climate, so this upgrade is welcoming. When the aircraft is on the ground, the airflow is much better. And when in flight, we must be careful so the cabin doesn't get too cold. The temperature selector can be set to about 12 o'clock and the system takes care of the rest. The control panel has a new push button labeled RAM Air. This has nothing to do with the cooling air as I just described. The RAM Air push button controls the emergency RAM Air valve, which provides atmospheric air to the cabin. It is intended to be used when both air conditioning packs have failed. When no air enters the cabin, the cabin will start to lose pressure as air is leaking out. If you are about 10,000 feet, the procedure is to descend. And you select ram air on. The air in the cabin will then be replaced with fresh air. When we breathe, we inhale oxygen and exhale CO2. If the rammer valve is closed, the maximum flight time is 80 minutes. 
After 80 minutes, it's calculated that the CO2 concentration in a cabin may reach 3%, which is considered a limitation for our cognitive function. The ram air enters the cabin via the duct for the ground air conditioning unit. The inlet is inside the right-hand ram air inlet. The new pressurization system is from Airbus. The control is now fully automatic. Landing elevation is set by the FMS when the destination airport is inserted. As a backup, the landing elevation can also be inserted manually. On earlier ATR variants, it is normal procedure to run the landing elevation up to the next 100 feet. With the new system, it's the opposite. If the destination airport has an elevation of 0 to 99 feet, the FMS sets the landing elevation to 0 feet. There is only one outflow valve, but it has two controllers, normal and backup. The backup system can also be controlled manually with this knob. The old pressurization system has two outflow valves. The new system appears to have two outflow valves as well, but only the left side is in use. The right hand side is closed. A more visible change is the addition of ventilation grills on each side of the tail cone. The tail cone is not pressurized and houses the voice recorder, the flight data recorder and flight controls. What's new are two safety valves attached to the aft pressure bulkhead. One safety valve opens when the positive differential pressure is 6.35 psi and the other when the negative differential pressure is minus 0.5 psi. The grills are added to ensure that there is no air pressure difference between the atmosphere and inside the tail cone. The operation of the system is also improved. With the old system, which ATR calls the legacy system, the old flow valves are fully open when the aircraft takes off. With the new system, the old flow valve closes after engines have been started. The different operation is shown here. To the left, the old system, the legacy, and to the right, the new one, the NAMS. After takeoff, the legacy cabin starts to climb with the aircraft. Then the old flow valves start to close and the cabin altitude starts to descend back to the airport elevation. With the new system, the cabin maintains airport elevation for a short time before starting to climb slowly. When passing 3,500 feet above airport elevation, the legacy system starts to climb or descend the cabin to the destination airport elevation. Later on, as the aircraft is climbing further, the cabin altitude starts to climb to maintain a predetermined pressure difference. When passing 10,000 feet, the legacy cabin has a different pressure of 4 psi. With the new pressurization system, the diff pressure is less and the cabin altitude is about 1,900 feet. The new engine variant, the Pratt & Whitney 127XT, looks like the previous engine and the operation is identical. The change is in increased airflow and a new hot section. ATR and Pratt & Whitney promise 40% longer time on the wing and 20% reduction in maintenance costs and 3% improvement in fuel efficiency. The last number is an understatement. Let me show you. I took some pictures of the instruments a few days ago. 
The aircraft weight was 19 tons and we were cruising at flight level 200 or 20,000 feet pressure altitude and the outside temperature was 15 degrees above standard. This is the operational data for ATR-72 at 19 tons, flight level 200 and ISA plus uh, 15 gives the following numbers. Torque 61.8%, the instruments show 61.7%. Uh, Indicated airspeed 191 knots, the instrument show 191. True airspeed 264 knots, the instrument show 266. Fuel flow 306 kilos per hour per engine, the instrument show 285. That's uh, roughly 20 kilos less. This table is valid for the old engine version. In other words, the total saving with this engine is 40 kilos per hour during cruise. The saving might be less during descent and ground operations, but 5% fuel saving should easily be within reach. And when you multiply that with total amount of flight hours in a year, you get quite a decent saving. We will soon receive a new ATR-42. It has the same engines as the ATR-72, but maximum power is reduced from 2,750 horsepower to 2,400 horsepower. But that's another story. Until then, thank you for watching, have a wonderful day, and happy landing!